a reproductive endocrinology and infertility specialist, both Canadian and American board certified, and you are watching Fertility Factor Fiction. Welcome to our show. I am here with my good friend Tarek Ibrahim from Ibrahim Strategies Group, and we are going to present a very cool uh, article tonight um, for patients that are going through IUI and have PCOS. And then we're going to take your questions live, which we do pretty much every week to try and help people learn more about fertility, know what works, what doesn't, and uh, make their journeys a lot more successful. Um, Want to make sure that you get a chance uh, as you're watching to hit the, uh, the subscribe button or follow button on whatever social media platform you are on. Um, if you're watching us on YouTube, want to say a huge thanks to the um, ever-growing community of YouTube followers for us. We have had over 120,000 views just in the last month alone, and uh, we get about 10 to 20 followers per day, which is nice. So uh, super thrilling for us, very exciting. And uh, just want to say thank you to everybody on all the different platforms. Instagram has been growing lately too, and so uh, it's been really great um, to see the, the fruits of our labors. So thank you for that. We appreciate it. Um, and uh, Tark appreciates it because that's his job. <laughs> so, uh, very cool for us to see that. So, um, hope you guys have all had a good week. Um, nothing really huge happened in the fertility world um, recently. Um, everything's being kind of uh, status quo uh, until I saw this article. So, um, it was a choice between this one and another article, which I'll probably review next week, which compared doing day three embryos to day five embryos. Um, so some people still believe in day three embryos. In fact, my embryologist from the last place I worked uh, swore up and down that day three embryos were just as good as day five. Um, the majority of the world does not believe that that's the case, and I, I would uh, definitely take issue with him um, on that topic and many others. And uh, so um, it looks like overall that the day three versus day five thing has some interesting new data available from a new study that kind of compared the two. So I think that's something worth looking at. But this, this is kind of an interesting opportunity to look at something that's very common in the fertility world, which is do we do just pills like Clomid or Letrozole for PCOS patients, or do we do shots for the PCOS patients or do we do a combination of pills and shots? And so this study actually looked at a comparison of the pills versus the combination. And they used a very unique protocol, which I have not seen before. And the question was, does adding in some shots uh, help you and get you a better outcome? And so we're gonna find out together tonight. Because if it does and their protocol works, it would be really interesting because they're only using it for three days, which is a very short duration to use shots for keeps the costs really low, so it makes it manageable for most people. And if it improves your success enough, it would be worthwhile the extra investment, the extra monitoring, and so on. So let's find out together. Okay, so the study is called Sequential Letrozole Gonadotropin versus Letrozole Alone for Ovulation Induction in Infertile Women with PCOS, a randomized controlled trial. So it kind of spells out the whole story for you right there. They took a group of women, 174 to be exact, they randomly assigned them, as long as they found out that they had PCOS, to either getting just letrozole, 2.5 milligrams per day, for days three to seven of the cycle, or 2.5 milligrams per day of the letrozole from days three to seven, and then day eight, nine, and 10 of the cycle with no pre-monitoring at all, they gave them 75 units of Menopure or HMG um, in that study. That's human menopausal gonadotropin. So for us, we would probably use Menopure for this. <clears throat> so super cool, very simple design, randomly allocated. Everybody had the same criteria. They all had PCOS. And then they took them and they said, okay, you're getting straight letrozole, which is the current first line therapy for women with PCOS, or you're getting letrozole, and we're going to give you just a couple of shots to see if we can kind of perk things up and get a better response. Primary outcome was the number of uh, women that uh, actually ovulated, and then they looked at clinical pregnancy. They actually had data on live birth, they had data on miscarriages, ectopic pregnancies, twins, like 
pretty much everything you could ask for. I'm going to apologize. This is a pre-print. It's a pre-proof. Uh, so I wanted this data out to you because it's very interesting data for everybody to be aware of. And um, the way that it's presented is suboptimal for visualization. But I, I will share it um, with you so that you can see it and uh, make sure that um, you can catch some of the stuff. And I'll try and circle it and show it to you when we get there. OK. So uh, how many women were there? As I mentioned, 174. Um, and they randomized them into the two equal groups. And the uh, process involved uh, the study being from August of 2019 until January of 2020. So they collected these patients fairly quickly over a short period of time. Obviously, sometime around January of 2020, COVID was breaking out. And um, this study was done in China, so I'm assuming that they shut it down because of that reason. But they were still able to maintain the uh, data on what happened to the patients afterwards. Um, the PCOS patients were defined by the Rotterdam criteria. So they either had irregular periods, um, hyperandrogenism, which are signs of having high testosterone or male hormone levels, polycystic ovaries on the ultrasound, they had to be 18 to 40, so they weren't including women that were much older. Um, and the duration of uh, infertility had to be more than a year. They had to have open tubes, and the spouse had to have reasonable sperm quality, nothing major there. So um, any allergies, um, inability to cooperate, severe endo, um, severe kidney, heart, uh, you know, organ system dysfunction. They kept all of those people out and no one that had um, any significant problems with their uterus, like a septum or large fibroids or anything like that. Okay, so we are going to um, just go quickly through what they did again. So they took these two groups, they randomized them. One group got 2.5 milligrams of letrozole, which is like the very low starting dose. We usually use five, but that's fine. They used 2.5. And they got that from day three to seven of their cycle. And the other group got uh, 2.5 from days three to seven. And then from day eight to 10, with no monitoring yet, they did um, if, uh, extra dose, 75 units a day of a human menopausal gonadotropin. For those of you watching, that would be something like Menopure. And then they analyzed everybody with ultrasound on day 11 and then decided when to trigger them based on follicle size. When they had enough of a appropriate follicle size, they triggered the release of the follicle, same criteria in both groups. And then they went ahead and told them to have timed intercourse. So this was not even an insemination study. It was just timed intercourse with the trigger shot and the medications that were given. Okay, so what did they find? Um, let me go to figure one, which is way through here at the end. Okay, so uh, if you can screen share. So you can see at the bottom of the screen there, and again, I apologize, this is pre-proof. They didn't have it in a really structured format. Um, age was pretty young. Most of these women were in their mid-20s, mid to late 20s. Obviously, almost everybody's Asian. Um, the interesting thing in this PCOS group is the BMI. So as you can see, uh, the BMIs are actually in the lower range. So the majority of these women um, are thin PCOS. Very few would have been heavier women um, with PCOS. So a little bit of a difference, and you've got to account for that when you're looking at the data. Do we know for sure that this would uh, be applicable to women that have um, you know, PCOS with weight concerns? We don't. That would have to be a different study. Um, but at least in the thin PCOS, this applies. And I would anticipate we would probably get a similar result in women that are heavier. Um, so fertility history, most of the patients had primary infertility, had suffered with it for some time. Um, their hormones were all more or less the same. There were no significant differences there. Um, they did monitor very carefully all of their sugar, glucose, insulin metabolism, um, and all of that was pretty much the same between both groups. No huge differences there. So if you look at table two, and I'll um, try and draw some stuff on for you here. Um, so yeah, I don't know how much I can expand that. How's that? Is that good? Okay, so um, 
in the first column here, you've got the letrozole group. And in this column, you've got the letrozole with the human menopausal gonadotropin. So you can see down here that in, and I better pick a thinner pen so everyone will be able to see this, or maybe yellow. So you can see here that um, 61 out of 87, or 70.1% in the letrozole group ovulated. In the letrozole plus the HMG group, it was 79 out of 87, which was actually almost 91%. So almost a 21% increase in the number of women that will ovulate by just adding three extra days of a shot, which is huge. That's really good. We want to see that. Um, the relative risk difference, 1.3. And when they looked at this uh, in terms of absolute difference, as I mentioned, it was 20.7%. So very substantial and very highly significant. So the p-value is kind of scrunched, but it's 0 0.001. So very, very strong data. More importantly, what they showed was, and I'll switch to yellow here. So what you can see here is that nine out of the 87 had a live birth in letrozole. So roughly about 10%, which is reasonable, but it was 20 out of the 87 in the letrozole plus HMG group. So why is this really critical? Well, traditionally, when we talk to patients about getting just letrozole for PCOS, we tell them, you got about an eight to 10% chance of getting pregnant every month. A little bit higher if you add an insemination, you're looking at maybe 15%. When we use shots alone, we know that we can get you up to that 20, maybe sometimes even 25% rate with insemination and on its own somewhere around 15 to 20. So what this study is showing us is you can actually get a very high success rate, about 23% in this study, when you use the <clears throat> letrozole with the HMG together, and that's very, very valuable information because usually letrozole with the shots gets you an in-between number between that 10% and that 20%, but this is actually saying you can get a very high success rate with just three days of these shots added in. So relative risk, again, 2.22, so 122% increase in success. And that works out to an absolute difference of 12.7. Uh, Again, super, super statistically um, significant. Okay, so I'll flip the page. Whoops. Okay, so if you look here now, and I'll have to scroll through this, when they did their per protocol analysis rather than intention to treat, the numbers were still essentially the same, higher rate of ovulation in the double group and a higher rate of live birth. So intention to treat is you were assigned to this group, you stuck in that group or didn't, we still analyze you like you did. Per protocol means what did they actually end up doing? Either way in this, highly significant results showing that the letrozole plus three days of shots doubled your success rates and significantly increased live birth. When they looked at the number of patients that had um, a single ovulation in the letrozole group, it was 51.7%. In the letrozole plus AMG group, it was actually even higher, which is unusual because normally you would think the shots would push it a little more, make you make two eggs, but in this group, it actually helped them make, um, make just one even more frequently. Uh, conception, which was just your positive beta HCG, 17.2% in letrozole, 33.3% in the letrozole plus HMG. So huge increase. And that's a very substantial number. So you're now looking at a very high success rate to just get pregnant using this protocol. Clinical pregnancy, where you can see a heartbeat, 13.8% with letrozole alone again, doubled when you go to the letrozole and HMG at 27.6%. Super important for us, what's the difference in terms of risk of twins? Because the reason people always shy away from doing the shots is, whoa, 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 what happens if we end up with twins? We don't wanna end up with twins, that's really risky. So what should we do? And the answer is, if you look here, the singleton pregnancy rate was 12.6%. In the letrozole group, it was 27.6%. In 
in the group with both. So you're actually getting a higher rate of the um, chance that it's a singleton when you did this. Now, when you go to twin pregnancy, it was 1.1% in the letrozole group. And ironically, it was 0% in the letrozole plus HMG. I find that surprising. And maybe it's just a fluke in this study. But again, it's a significant difference. And that's important for you to know. Ongoing pregnancy, 11.5, 25.3%. Pregnancy loss, 5.7 in the letrozole group, 8% in the letrozole and HMG group. But if you scroll over to here where you can see me circling in the yellow there, it is not statistically significantly different. They also saw, um, whoops, they also saw no difference in any of the factors related to miscarriage, fetal death, or any of those elements. So ectopics, abnormal pregnancies, any of that stuff. It was all essentially the same. So the next part of this um, was just some extra analyses. And at the end of it all, when they analyzed it, they said the chances of success when they stratified for reproductive outcomes was sky high. So you can see, and again, this is pre-proof, so it's hard to estimate. But if you looked at women with a reasonable BMI and they looked at the chance of ovulation and live birth subsequently, um, if I highlight it for you here, you'll understand, you have a 275% increase in the chance that you would successfully have a live birth if you have a reasonably low BMI or just slightly overweight and you are uh, attempting to use the letrozole with the AMG. If your BMI was over 28, um, they use that as the reference group. And then if you were very high BMI, which was the strata four, um, you still had a higher success rate. And same thing with strata five, um, it was still a higher success rate. So all of these uh, show a significant benefit, except in that last category, it was not statistically significant because the p-value was over 0.05. So um, where does all this leave us? Well, <clears throat> the reality is that all of us, every fertility specialist I know, typically will turn to letrozole to stimulate patients with PCOS. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Um, if they have uh, oligoovulation, they're not ovulating. And some of us will use shots, but I tell patients all the time when they have PCOS, if I use shots and you have very strong ovaries, there's a very good chance I'm going to turn you into octomom because we control over how many eggs you have. In fact, we have to bring some of them and drain their eggs here before we do the insemination in order to proceed because some people would just make too many eggs. This study, using this very unique protocol, shows that with just three days of shots, so you're talking about an extra couple hundred bucks, you can actually double the success rates and get very good increases in live birth rate that are very meaningful and powerful. So we will start implementing this very soon from now on. For anybody that can afford the extra bit of shots, we're gonna start doing those shots and implement that into the letrozole program that we do, especially when we're doing IUI, because this is a very good way to get singleton pregnancies in PCOS women with a very low additional cost and no significant increase in intervention other than three shots. So I love this study. I think it's a groundbreaking study. I think it's a paradigm shift. Um, I'm hoping there will be other studies, hopefully in an American population. I may even try and duplicate this here in our own PCOS population to see how it applies in women who are a little bit um, heavier and have a higher BMI. So super cool study, uh, very interesting data. Is it a factor of fiction that using letrozole with injectables together just for three days, if you have PCOS will improve your live birth rate? It actually is true. It will improve your live birth rate and your success rate. No difference in miscarriage or abortion or ectopic, way better outcomes, very, very strong results and uh, super cool information to share with you all. So I uh, hope you enjoyed that part of the show. Um, we are going to ask you guys to comment. Always like your comments. What do you think of this study? Do you think we should try one here? Let us know. And make sure you hit that like button and subscribe. 
so we're going to take your questions live now. <clears throat> ready? Always ready. I'll get the drawing app up just in case I need it. Oh, yeah. Great. Because I love that one. Oh, we start great. Okay. Hello, Dr. TV. <laughs> I don't think you can start better. This show's off to a great start. This show is off to a great start. Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, your Lethazol protocol for FET, does that pertain to DE patients as well? If so, yeah. what if my periods are irregular? Can I still start with Lethazol? Yeah, you can. Um, if you're uh, menopausal and that's why you need donor eggs, it may not work as well, but we still use it because it's still reasonable to attempt it with the Lethazol to keep your estrogen levels low because we know the high estrogen levels are harmful um, and decrease your chances. So yeah, we still use it even with donor egg, even if your cycles were irregular. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hi, T. Hi, Hi T. Dr. V. <laughs> Y'all make me look forward to Tuesdays. Oh, yes. I like that, man. That's, That's cool. Great. Yeah. Uh, That's really good. No one's ever said that to just us. Just a straight up high T. Just a straight up high tea. You're loving this, eh? He's milking it, people. I think we just end the show right here. It can only, you know, this is the best. It's, you're done. I'm good. I feel great today. Uh, and on a high note. Yeah. You mentioned a lot about your FET protocol. I was yeah. wondering what your protocol for DE FET is also. Is fertilis always used? Um, so our protocol it's always for, reliable. Have oh. you ever had results come back inconclusive? We've never had fertilisis come back inconclusive. Um, and our FET protocol is the same for our DE cycles as it is for our, um, you know, autologous cycles. So, um, and we share it all the time. Um, I can do it again. We should just make it a video and put it out. A faribo will kill me, though. I can't do that. Uh, Dr. Khosravi, our, our embryologist. Yeah, I would need Kevlar vest, like bodysuit. She doesn't want me sharing the secret. So, um, and, and I love our embryologist. She's phenomenal. So, uh, our lab director, sorry, not our embryologist. Um, so, yeah, she will kill me if I share every secret. But uh, basically, we have a letrozole based protocol. We use um, pro antibiotics and then probiotics. There's lots of supplements, vitamin D, fish oils, melatonin, aspirin. Um, we monitor your cycle very carefully. We only add estrogen if your lining is not thick enough. Um, once your lining achieves the desired thickness, we add in uh, the progesterone. We use vaginal and injectable progesterones. We monitor your progesterone levels after three days, make sure it's in the correct range. Assuming everything is good and you're in the right range, we're good to go at that point and we will aim for your transfer. Day five embryo goes in after you've completed five days of exposure. So on the morning of the sixth day um, or afternoon of the sixth day and a day six embryo, we try and actually go the extra sixth day. Hi, Dr. Victory. I've been deemed useless. You, you were deemed useless. <laughs> <laughs> but for what it's worth, I also yeah. can't answer it. Okay, there you go. Fairness, yeah. It, it, so it, if you can stump Tarek, you don't have to name him. That's yeah, the yeah, new yeah, rule. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I don't mind the hello. Uh, my husband's semen analysis had a high <clears throat> leukocytospermia. Okay. 1.2. Okay. What does it mean? And do you have a CoQ10 recommendation? Um, 600 milligrams of CoQ10, unless you're using the one from Therologix, which is called NeoQ10, I think which you only need 125 milligrams for because it's so potent. But we had loads of patients that got a rash from it, so we had to stop using that. Um, but I did love it. It worked really well. Um, as far as leukocytosis or, or leukospermia, um, he has white blood cells in his semen. So there's probably either prostatic irritation or an infection. Where he got that and how he got that, I have no idea. There's no way to know. However, um, it's treatable with antibiotics and then just repeat the test. So typically we'll put our guys on 10 days of doxycycline for that, unless they very clearly have evidence of prostatitis um, from saying that it hurts or they're really sore and they'd often have a fever and that kind of thing. If that's the case, 
then um, you need a lot more antibiotics. That's more of like a Cipro and Flagyl and CA urologist kind of situation. So now you know. Now I know and I can answer it next now, time. Now Tarek can answer it next yeah. time. Yeah. So now, don't don't miss him in the questioning. Yeah, now I'm the time. local spermia specialist. <laughs> there you go. Question. Yeah. My doctor wants to use dexamethasone yeah. versus prednisone for my next FET protocol. Yeah. I've only heard about prednisone mm -hmm. for FETs. Are there specific reasons to use one over the other? Uh, no, and they both function the same. Although, to be honest, um, we've reviewed it on the show before, and it's actually sitting in front of me. Um, there's lots of evidence that dexamethasone is actually really beneficial. I got a whole folder on dexamethasone. <laughs> so uh, dexamethasone is great. It's good for women with... Um, uh, you know, ovarian response issues. Um, we'll probably start implementing it into our protocols. It's good for women who have uh, high levels of progesterone early on in their cycle, um, all sorts of different reasons why DEX is, is beneficial. So um, if he wants to use DEX, I would totally support that. It's fine. Oh, we got some YouTube Instagram bouncing, but I caught it before I asked you. Okay. Hey, Dr. V. Anti. Anti. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for doing what you do. Our You're pleasure. so very busy, but you still have time to do this. I <laughs> hope we have more doctors like you. Oh, thank you. See you on Thursday for my egg retrieval. Oh, sounds awesome. Yeah. Today we did three and they were all like amazing. Um, uh, special congrats to the one patient that had um, way, way more <laughs> mature eggs than I ever thought you would have. So um, I hope you're feeling well and make sure you text me if you're watching, um, if you have any signs or symptoms of issues. So congrats, you're going to have a lot of babies. Hi, Dr. V and T. Hope you had a great day. What are the odds of IVF being successful in a 30 year old woman with DOR? Um, it depends on how bad the DOR is. I mean, if you can make at least one egg, you actually have a pretty decent chance of success if we keep at it and we try enough times. Is it going to be inexpensive? No, it'd probably be pricey, but it's doable. If you're menopausal, the chances drop off precipitously. Um, we are looking at the potential for doing PRP into the ovary. I'm not sure if it works or not yet. So I'm a little hesitant, but our lab director wants us to try it. So um, we are considering trying that. So I think that that's a valuable thing to, uh, to consider. I just had Sono today. Okay. And saw on the report, yeah. a check mark next to malformation. What could that be? I'm waiting for the official report and to talk to my doctor. Um, well, it could be anything. You could have a septum, you could have a bicornuate uterus, you could have a polyp or a fibroid, it could be T-shaped or Y-shaped. Um, it could be unicornuate, it could be didelphic, which is like when there's only one side or you actually have two separate uteri. There's no way for me to tell you just from a check mark, right? So um, there could be a million different things. Uh, no way for me to know. We always show our patients the picture and tell them right there. I'm kind of surprised yours didn't. So, um, yeah, let us know though when you find out. Most common would be a polyp or a fibroid. Second most common would probably be a septum. Uh, I guess this is feedback to the study. I did a result of Kurgan in 2018 and yeah. my daughter. Yeah. That's awesome feedback. Thank you. Uh, lots of thumbs up and likes for you. That's good. Uh, yeah. I mean, this study is kind of a game changer. We used to do it for patients that wanted that like in between protocol. They didn't want the shots. They didn't want letrozole alone. The cool thing with this is we would always start our shots on the sixth day. Uh, um, so day three, we would do letrozole for three days and then we would start the shots on day six. This is actually saying you can delay that till day eight and then just give the minimum and still get really, really good results with extremely high success rates and way lower cost. So I love that because I love saving my patients money. And this is a great way to save you a lot of money and up our success rate. So very, very cool data. Thank you. I enjoyed the paper review. Hands clapping. Praises. You're the man. 
<laughs> I think that's what that, that all means. I, I, I see you in there. Uh, you are welcome and thank you. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, hi, Dr. VNT. How about the back again? The, you're, you're dropping off as yeah, we yeah, go. Yeah. Eventually, I'm not going to be mentioned anymore. For cases where you prime with DHEA, yeah. how long before stims do you prime with DHEA? Three months. Every study out there has shown three months. What is your experience with the donor agency Egg Helpers? It is reputable at good success rates? Um, so I'm going to very judiciously not say anything on public uh, social media. If you would like to know about our experiences, um, get a consult and chat with me and I will happily provide you with information on any of the agencies I have worked with. Um, and we can go over uh, results and what the teams are like and uh, who's good and, and who we've had issues with and stuff like that. So um, we'd be happy to help you out. Um, we are probably one of, if not the largest providers of third-party services in Canada now. So just reach out and we'd be happy to help you out. Hi, Dr. V. Anti. Anti. At what point do you think you would consider adding the combo within the IUI process immediately or only after failed attempts with buttresol, only IUI trial? Yeah, you know, I think this study is really kind of an eye opener. So for me, it's it's a financial question. It's not a um, it's not a failure success question. So if you can afford the shots or even better, you have coverage, it'd be crazy not to. I mean, this is randomized controlled trial data. It's very strong. So um, if you can double your outcome, why would we not do that? Like it's a huge difference in success. So yeah, of course, I think we should do this for everybody, um, but not everybody has coverage and the shots are gonna add considerably to your cost. Um, uh, three vials of Menopur altogether, you're probably getting close to about uh, $300 plus or minus a little bit. So. Yeah, I mean, that's substantial. It's it's definitely not inexpensive. And as a result of that, um, it's not for everybody because now you've got to pay for your IUI. If you're, God help you, if you're in Toronto, you're spending, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of dollars on your IUIs. They keep making people pay double to do double IUI, which is useless. Um, so if you're doing a, you know, double IUI and now you've also got to add in the shots, you're paying like a quarter of the price of doing IVF. That doesn't make sense no matter how good this success rate is. So yeah, I would I would want to look at your coverage. I would want to look at how much your IUI is costing you. We only charge $350 for IUI, so um, $450 if we're using the Zymo device. So uh, we're a lot more reasonable and so you can you know absorb some extra cost. But for other places and other people, or, or just people that can't even afford that, it, you know, they have to calculate it for themselves. Okay, I have to make sure I went in the right order. Okay. There's a lot of V and T's and there's some T and V's. <laughs> and I'm trying to give precedence you know what I mean? to the T and V's. To the T and V's. In a, in, a, in a respectful way, like not all the way to the bottom. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Hi, Dr. V and T. Okay. I had two IVF cycles where my, I, my, where my AFC yeah. was 15 at the start of the cycle. Okay. I just went in yesterday for my third cycle and my AFC was seven. Nope. Is it a good idea to continue the cycle? Well, I don't know how many eggs you got from your other cycles, but if you got over seven, no, I would wait until you have another cycle where you get more eggs. That's a good question. No one's asked us anything like that before. Uh, Great question. Uh, I, I You're picking the good ones. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Bravo for Tarek. They're all good uh, questions. Lots of those floating up hearts on Instagram yes, for Tarek. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hi, Dr. V and T. Yeah. I like to do my own research. Okay. There's always such conflicting articles. Yeah. When doing at home <laughs> research, is there any <laughs> reputable sites you recommend or sites to stay away from? Thanks. Well, all research should be done off of PubMed. And then within PubMed, you need to know how to read scientific articles. So you need to know how to search them. You need to know how to read them. You need to know how to apply them, understand them, which actually kind of takes a whole training session uh, and in fact months, plus you need the medical knowledge. So it, it'd probably be easier for me to tell you what to avoid 
Um, avoid blogs, avoid opinion, 100% avoid anything that you read that someone wrote on social media um, because a lot of it is just um, complete misinformation. Um, months ago, uh, I think it was in the winter time, I saw a post from a British doula, I think she was, or maybe she was a midwife, I, I can't remember now, who said that it was okay to delay inducing your baby and your pregnancy until past 42 weeks because there was no reason to induce. And she actually said, if your obstetrician or your midwife told you you have to deliver by 42, that's not true, da, da, da. So I, I very quietly and politely questioned her in an instant message. And I said, are you aware that what you are saying is categorically incorrect? Here's all the references. Here are the randomized control trials. Here's the data. And then she said, well, go look at this blog. And I was like, okay, I don't need to look at a blog. We're talking about randomized controlled trial data, European, because she was in England and in North America. And they blocked me from their post uh, because they didn't like that I was saying something that was against what they were saying. So then I came out with that YouTube video, which we posted, which which is at eight and a half thousand today. Yeah. So that was great because we only put it up a little while ago. So yeah, I mean, you gotta be very careful about doing your own research. I love the fact that you do your own research. I love having educated patients. I've learned from my patients. I got fertilisis from one of my favorite patients. So uh, there's nothing wrong with patients being educated, but being educated requires that you really know how to read the articles. That's not an easy thing. Maybe we could, do a session on how to read, but I think it would bore the hell out of most very people. That would be very dry. Yeah. So in any event, um, PubMed is where you go. Any of the societies, so CFAS for Canada, ASRM for the United States, ESHRAE for Europe, they have guidelines. If you can access them, um, get into their guidelines. Look at that. Those are where they sit down panels of experts to go through the science and figure out what works and what doesn't work. I pulled it on YouTube for it. If we should, we should. Maybe they want us to. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's good. Should we do a study on how to interpret articles. Do a presentation on, yeah. on how to interpret. Sure. Yeah. 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 And you know what? Just before we go on, I will say I have been wanting to do a video, and we should, this one we should do on controversy because there are some subjects where literally every week someone says the opposite thing endometrial biopsy being number one. Every week, somebody says endometrial biopsy is good. It increases your success rate. And the next week, they say, no, it doesn't. And then the next week, they say, yes, it does. And the next week, they say, no, it doesn't. Um, there are lots of things like that out there where it's hard to know what the truth is because there are conflicting studies. So unless you know how to analyze those studies properly, you can walk away with the wrong idea. I usually just listen to you. That's a good yeah, Tarek just listens to me. I would be happy to have you all just listen to me. Um, I do at least know how to read the studies. So, hey, Doctor V, you did my IVF transfer on August fourth. Okay. I was testing positive at home on five DPT. Yes. Had first beta on eight DPT. Yes. It was seventy two point nine. Okay came back for second beta at 11 dpt yeah and my beta was 612. okay i'm doubling every 23 hours right do you think yes the embryo could have split <laughs> yes. based on those numbers why on earth i don't know who you are because Tarek's reading the questions on a screen that i am not facing however why did you test on day five no one should be testing on day five. In fact, I think she messaged me and I told her not to test on day five. Do not test on day five and um, just wait until we do your ultrasound. You're pregnant. Everything's going great. Don't test anymore. Stop testing. Relax. Congratulations. Um, thank you for adding to our long list of successes. And we'll go from there. But for God's sakes, for everybody else that's listening, do not test on day five. Okay. Don't go for a blood test on day five. It is way too early. And yes, you probably split into identical twins. And she ended it with, you know, thank you. You're an amazing doctor. <laughs> da, 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 da. Oh, no, that's the good stuff, man. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing to me? <laughs> uh, also, thank you for being such an amazing doctor. Aww. 
My IPS are so happy they chose your clinic. Amazing. Those are IPs, the intended oh, parents. IP That's plural. awesome. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Phenomenal. Um, sometimes they do a whole bunch of questions. I have one question, so it's not disclosed. Oh, okay. okay. A friend of mine also has endometriosis. She did one FET with Lupin beforehand and one successful FET with an aspirin regimen and steroids. Sure. Do you think that protocol works? Um, so protocols that have been proven to work for patients with endo are either surgery or Lupron with letrozole together for three months, and then a low estrogen protocol when you're going through it. Aspirin has nothing to do with endo, although it might help with the inflammation. Steroids will potentially benefit, although I'm not aware of any actual studies that have compared steroid for FET in endo patients. You know what? That'd be a good one to look up. Remember that and I'll, I'll check that out. So, uh, yeah, I'm not aware of anything specifically in that regard, but um, you, you need like supplements for endo. You need a low estrogen protocol. Um, anything that's anti-inflammatory will help. So aspirin's good. Steroids are good. All of that stuff. Hey, T. Hey, T. Oh, I'm left out now. No, no, no. And Dr. B. Oh, and Dr. But B. I just waited for it. I gave it you, a little bit of... You gave it a hang. Yeah, I gave it a hang. That's right. All right. I did four retrievals with five, six mats. Follicles. Whoa. Okay. Only ever retrieving three egg <clears throat> mats. Okay. Then AMH went from 0.2 to 0.5 and had 15 follicles with 12 eggs retrieved. My doc wasn't phased by it. What do you think? Uh, that makes no sense whatsoever at all. So you did something different between those. I don't know what, but... Um, that there's something very, very different happening there. Maybe you were suppressed. Maybe you were on the wrong protocol. Maybe there's something about your hormones going on they didn't detect, but that's not normal at all, at all. Yeah. I've never seen anyone do that. So um, that would be highly unusual. Dr. B and happy Tuesday. And no question today. Just <clears throat> wanted to thank you for the learning session and your time. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I love the fact that everyone out there is so polite. Thank you for being so polite and friendly and supportive of the work that we do. That is very, very kind and heartwarming. And it does kind of make it worthwhile for us. So thank you. Can I eat raw turmeric while on Lupron Depot? Or should I start towards the end of Lupron, closer to FET? No, you can use it the whole time. The rate of live birth after a chemical pregnancy. The rate of live birth after a chemical pregnancy? Hmm. Are there the chances of getting a live birth? I'm not sure if you're asking what's your chance of a live birth after your last one was a chemical pregnancy. There is no way for me to answer that. I need to know a million details about you. But if you're asking what your rate of live birth with, is after a positive beta, that depends on a lot of factors also. So people are always asking us rate questions. There are some I can answer. The majority I can't because I need an hour long consult with you in order to know you to kind of tell you what your rates and chances are. Um, if you want information on general kind of numbers, watch our video called Embryo Math. It's our biggest video on YouTube. Um, it should be hitting 84,000 anytime now. Um, so watch that video. We got a party when we hit 100. So I always do quick skims of the questions to make sure yeah. you know, if someone says audio sucks or I can't hear or, you know, yeah, yeah, sure yeah. we're good, right? Yeah, yeah. So I stumbled upon this. Okay. It's nowhere near where we're supposed to be, but I think it's a very good comment. Okay. I feel like my doctor is getting tired of hearing Dr. Victory says. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I you know what? We got to post that. I That'll be Wednesday's winners. Yeah. So on Instagram, we're going to start something kind of structured from now on. So Mondays are going to be um, multiple choice questions. So Monday, multiple choice. Tuesdays are going to be Tuesday tweets. So I'll tweet something and then post about it on Instagram. Wednesdays, plus we have the show, obviously. Wednesdays are going to be Wednesday winners. So things that are, you know, the highlight of the week or cases that succeeded after difficulty or something like that. 
Thursdays are going to be thoughts or something inspirational. And then Fridays, we'll post an ad for the upcoming FFOF. So um, we'll put that on Wednesdays, winners tomorrow. Can you screenshot that yeah, and send sure, it to me or sure, something? Sure, That'd sure. be great. That is too funny. Hi, Dr. T. Dr. T. I, and V. You know, we're running into problems with this whole <laughs> Dr. T. <laughs> Okay, I think you guys are creating a monster. He's going to start wearing a lab coat around I'm here. Straight I'm just going to walk into the yeah. OR and just assume the position. Yeah, if any of you, um, you know, end up seeing a Middle Eastern guy that does not look like me walking around in the clinic with a lab coat, that is Tarek sneaking around as me. So just be careful with that. It's going to be what I do during my spare time. Yeah. I'm just going to wrap it in here. Uh, Use less resolve, gone left, and IUI cycles failed. Okay. But had better results than first IVF cycle ended up canceled. Okay. And not using less resolve. Should I use less resolve in the next IVF protocol? Yes. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I would need to see you, know you, learn more about you, all that good stuff. But um, the reality is that the studies support less if your ovaries are weak. It kind of sounds like that's the case for you. Um, so we use it for our women with weaker ovaries. So yeah, I would do that. Um, we reviewed that about a month ago now, I think, on the show, where, or maybe it was longer than that, where we showed that adding letrozole into your stimulation actually increases your chances of success. Um, and so that's something that you should consider and should look at. We are still at 83,000 on embryo math. Stagnant? No, it's going up oh, like God. crazy. Yeah. Do, we are still on like... Well, no, that's since this morning. Oh, wow. <laughs> still is a relative term. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we have, um, we go up. I don't know if you've seen this, but we... I'm watching it. Have you? No, it's quite the spectacle. Um, so we've been going up roughly around two to 3,000 views per day. Been right. huge yeah really yeah we're at 778,231 right now so yeah it's it's big it's a big deal hey t hey t and dr v and dr v <laughs> when would you suggest to do the prp before a transfer thank you yeah so um if it's prp to thicken your uterus um i would do it the month before i'm kind of feeling like that's probably the way to go so you can do it in the cycle and if it works great if it doesn't work hold off wait for the next month if you're doing it in order to affect immune issues or unexplained failures you want to do it 48 hours before that's what the studies did hi dr victory how does a letrozole lupron SVP protocol look like Lupron and letrozole for three months. Um, extend your letrozole for five extra days past the three months. Stop, wait for your follicle to develop. Easy, really easy. And then try not to take estrogen unless you need it. If you do very, very small doses, like one milligram of estrace, um, minimal, 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 even less if you can. And then when you uh, are ready, Take your progesterone vaginal and progesterone in oil. Get your levels monitored. Go for your transfer, plus all the supplements and stuff like that. Hi, Dr. V and T. I have ovulated and got pregnant while, while using letrozole 5 milligram day 3 to 7, but miscarried. Would you oh. recommend I try adding the three shots? Well, it didn't show any difference in miscarriage rate. So um, it will help you get pregnant without any change in miscarriage. So if you're gonna try it to facilitate getting pregnant, yes, if you're doing it to avoid miscarriage, it won't help you. So that's not gonna change anything. Yeah, but uh, I definitely think it'll help you get pregnant. So I would advise it for that purpose. Hi, Dr. BNT. I have ovulated and got pregnant while using, oh, sorry. Oh, you just read yeah. one, yeah. Newly diagnosed stage four endometriosis and SP oh. excision laparoscopy. Any words of wisdom? prior to transfer or future repeat retrieval. Will a repeat retrieval make the endometriosis lesion return? Um, so, okay, let's start with uh, advice before transfer. Um, even after your excision, I would do three months of Lupron and Letrozole. Stay on all the supplements. So there's four, it's NAC, Coenzyme Q10, uh, Turmeric or Curcumin, and Resveratrol. 
Um, in addition to that, make sure when you do your embryo transfer, you use that low estrogen protocol. You don't want to have a strong, um, you know, stimulation of estrogen in there. You want almost none if possible. Uh, so all of that would be very, very important. If your uterus is also retroverted, which is very often the case in patients with severe endo, you need a transvaginal ultrasound guided embryo transfer. So I'm a big proponent of that for patients with bad endo. With regards to um, the second part, the second part of the question was, um, uh, what was it? Uh, the lesions return. Mm. Newly diagnosed stage four yeah. endometriosis with SP excision laparoscopy. Yeah. Any words of wisdom prior to the transfer of future right. repeat retrievals? And will a repeat oh. retrieval make the end of Right, right, right. Will it come back? Uh, so, yes, um, stimulation with IVF, depending on how strong your ovaries are, will worsen your endo. Another good indication to be on letrozole because it'll keep your estrogen levels low. So, there are ways to try and minimize it, but no matter what you do, if your estrogen levels are going up, you're stimulating your endo. So, you could get a resumption of your lesions. Okay. What are your thoughts on LDN for endometriosis? Um, I'm not familiar too much with the literature out there on LDN. So that's low dose naltrexone for those of you that are wondering for endometriosis. It's big in the PCOS world. I never got into it. I looked at the data. It wasn't convincing for me, but... Um, we can look it up. Uh, I just don't think it, it makes a huge amount of sense. I, I thought it was um, of minimal value. Hey, you know, someone just called us Hey TV Crew. Hey not TV bad. Crew. Oh, I like that. That's the TV bad. Crew. That's not bad. Yeah, that's not bad. Uh, do you recommend wheatgrass regularly for patients with DOR? No. Um, and I looked up wheatgrass and there was insufficient evidence to be convincing for me. Uh, low, hang on, dose, now trexone and endometriosis. Your search is processed without automatic term mapping. Uh, no results were found and I spelt it all correctly. Let's look up just now trexone. Yeah, so um, there's nothing on naltrexone and endometriosis, which is probably why I didn't know about it because I do read a lot. So uh, no, there's nothing. So I can't say that I've ever recommended that before. Next. Hi, T and Dr. V. You're really hung up on that today. I think the fans enjoy it too. I think, I think they the do. Watchers get a kick out they, of this. They're, yeah, we, we're right. going to. There's yeah. something going on here. I know. Pretty soon we're going to need to put on boxing gloves and go at it every time they say something. My yeah. doc started me on Letrozole 2.5 milligrams and estrus together beginning at cycle day three to 10 or seven days. What? They started them on Letrozole and estrus? Yeah, together. Okay, that makes no sense. But anyways, yeah. Uh, it's a donor egg cycle. Does this sound right? No, that makes no sense whatsoever. You don't use letrozole and esterase. The whole point of using letrozole is to avoid the esterase. That's someone that doesn't know how to manage the cycle. I wouldn't recommend it. Tarek wouldn't recommend it either. Dr. T here is also saying he doesn't believe yeah. it. Yeah. That's right. No, that to me, um, with due respect to whoever's doing that, uh, that doesn't make sense and is probably um, someone that's starting to use letrozole that doesn't have experience with the literature on letrozole for embryo transfer or experience using it themselves. You don't need the esterase and it, it's just um, like my EMR system, our electronic medical record system, it won't even let me prescribe those two at the same time because the letrozole is actually doing the opposite of the estrogen. It's counteracting it. So that's just creating conflict in your body. Don't do that unless you have to. So the computer won't even let you do it. No, if I go into the EMR and I pop in esterase and letrozole, it'll go eh, 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 and it'll tell you you can't do that. Yeah. Hi, Dr. VNT. How often and for how long 
should you have intralipids during pregnancy? So no one knows um, for sure. So I can just tell you our protocol and the literature. The literature is split into two groups. One was like 12 weeks. The other one was for like the whole pregnancy. So you're normally going to see people do it five to 10 days before an embryo transfer, sometimes on the day of the embryo transfer, when you get your positive beta, and then every six weeks. So that's what we do. Hi, Dr. VNT. Do you check lining and give progesterone support after IUI procedure? We don't check lining after the IUI procedure, but we give everybody progesterone support. Yeah, for sure. Progesterone is great for fertility. I mean, all the studies that said that it wasn't useful are horribly poorly done studies because they started too late or ended too early or don't administer it the right way. So um, progesterone can be very, very helpful in the right circumstances. Uh, I did doctors on trigger shots for timed intercourse. Yeah. I had PCOS. Yeah. I had a 19 millimeter and a 15 millimeter follicle on trigger day. 10 to 15 millimeter yield of mature egg. Um, listen, I retrieved, uh, I, on Saturday, I did one of the ultrasounds myself, which is fairly rare because we're too busy for me to be standing there doing all the ultrasounds. And uh, on, a, on a person who is very dear to me, and um, I noted that she had a reasonable number of eggs and a bunch that were kind of playing catch up. Um, and I was not anticipating any of those would catch up. They were small, like 10 millimeter, 11 millimeter, 12 millimeter. So we did her retrieval today. So remember, I just, you know, triggered her on um, Sunday night. So one day after I had seen her and I was expecting like 10 or 11 good mature eggs, maybe a few more. She had 39 that were mature. So um, that is staggeringly high. Uh, and so you can get mature follicles even when they're smaller. If you look at the literature on this, the literature says that the risk of finding an immature follicle drastically increases when they're less than 12 millimeters. But even at 12, there's about a 25 to 30% chance that the follicle will be mature. So it's possible. Yeah, so a 15 is going to have an even higher chance. I think if I remember that data correctly, it's about uh, almost close to 30%. I'm joining your clinic as soon as we're done our testing. Transferring from another clinic after a move, wondering how many IUIs you will do uh, before moving to IVF and how long the IVF wait list is. Um, so we do... Uh, a maximum of six IUI if you're under 38 and a maximum of three if you're over 38 because there's a great study that showed that you shouldn't do more than that. Um, so that's what we do. Um, for the patients who uh, want to move to IVF, you can move to IVF at any time. Um, and then in regards to our funded list, I think we're full for this year, but we will um, have cycles again available next year. So um, we've got about a one year wait list. What supplements to take while on Lupron Depot? Vitamin D, C, E, magnesium, calcium, NAC, prenatal, et cetera. Thanks. Um, all of the ones you just mentioned, <laughs> uh, the fish oils, um, curcumin, if you've got endometriosis, uh, resveratrol and um, NAC, NAC, and coenzyme Q10. How long after an FET, if unsuccessful, can you do a new egg retrieval? Uh, um, the next month at the earliest, but it depends on what your diagnosis is. Many people want to plunge into fertility because they're so worried about waiting a month. Waiting even up to six months with diminished ovarian reserve has no bearing on the outcome. You get the exact same live birth rate. And that's from a trial where they compared women that went right away to women that waited six months to optimize everything. And they, they had the same outcome. There was no decrease in the ones that waited. So uh, I'm not suggesting you wait because if the outcome is the same, potentially you could go ahead quickly, but it doesn't help you. So give us a chance to optimize things because at least you're going to get your best chance. And that makes the most sense. Don't go rushing into any fertility therapy with anyone anywhere. It's a guaranteed recipe for nothing. And like I said in my tweet today, we're making babies. We're not baking cookies here. So don't do cookie cutter medicine. Don't go rushing in and just throw everything together. It's not going to work. 
and 42 DOR and possible endometriosis. AMH is 0.27 and AFC um, between four and six. Okay. So they do a lot of laparoscopy or Lupron Depot before transfer and does endometriosis around ovaries affect quality? Um, endo affects egg quality. That was our multiple choice from yesterday. Um, it affects implantation. It affects everything. So yes, endo can have an impact. But because your stim, even though you have a low intrafollicle count, unfortunately, in the DOR, will increase your estrogen levels temporarily, the theoretical proper sequence should be, if you have access to it, Vizan for three months because it's been proven to be beneficial for endo patients, then do your egg retrieval, then do surgery, then do suppression, then do your embryo transfer. It's long, but it gives you your best chance. Um, I was getting late. 901. So there's people asking, you know, we're asking my question again. I see that happening. Yeah. But I want them to know it's just because there's so many questions. Okay. So for those of you that are desperately asking your question multiple times, we do try to get to all of them, but there are so many questions to answer. Hey, there's quite a bit. Okay. Um, hi, T. Thank you, Skip. So we'll ask again. <laughs> okay. Dr. V. Yeah. Do you have any recommendations for affordable IVIG treatments in GTA, or do you provide IVIG at your clinic? Thanks. Um, you don't need IVIG because subcutaneous IG is just as effective and it's free and there is no such thing as affordable IVIG. It's Our cost is, I think, over $5,000 for the average dose that most women need. That's our cost. Um, I think the last patient that came here, we paid her, we charged her $200 to do the whole therapy. So it wasn't even like we were making money on it. But um, the reality is you can get subcutaneous IG for free. And yeah, we do provide that here for free. So come for your subcutaneous IG therapy. It's just as good. 902. Put that out there. Your call, man. I live only to serve you. Oh. And, and all of these and people. All these amazing people. Yeah, yeah. And all these amazing people. Yeah. Um, this is always a fun question. Okay. Donor eggs, fresh or frozen better. Does it matter if both offer a guaranteed live birth plan? Um, so fresh is always better. It's close to double the success rate. Um, you'll get way more embryos so that you don't have to pay for it all over again. Um, so that's hugely important as well. Uh, and then the bigger issue is the guaranteed live birth plans with uh, frozen um, eggs you've got to keep changing, right? Because if they run out and they don't have more eggs from that donor, now you got to switch donor. When you do a guaranteed live birth plan with a fresh donor, we're going to get you like 25, 30 eggs. So you're going to have all the embryos you ever need for as many children as you want forever. We we did a cycle for someone today and, um, or I mean recently, and she just came to see us today and make sure her uterus was good after I had to operate on her uterus. She used donor eggs she made over 30 embryos, blastocysts. So she has like an army of children waiting for her. Um, that's what you want. I mean, not that everybody needs 30 embryos, but you want to have a high number of embryos to get your best outcome. When you do a live birth guarantee with donor eggs, they're giving you six or eight frozen eggs. You're not going to get a good outcome from that. So don't bother. And it's super expensive. It's actually more expensive to do a live birth um, frozen egg guarantee than it is to pay for a fresh donor. So I, I don't believe in it. Okay. Excuse me. Hi, Dr. VNT. Okay. Can you please clarify why a patient with endo and retroverted uterus should do a transvaginal embryo transfer? Picture time. I've been waiting all night for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. I figured you'd like that. I do like that one. Yeah. Okay. I get to draw. I like drawing. Okay. Uh, I don't need tips. I need to draw. Oh, share. Oh, yeah, I got to share. Sharing is caring. Absolutely. All right. Okay, so um, I don't want the keyboard, though. I want to draw. Let's see if we can get the drawing up. Okay, so um, if, okay, I am no artist, so please forgive me, right? So if, um, the head is here, 
and the feet are down here, your uterus normally is gonna be sitting like that. This part here is the fundus, and this part here is your cervix, okay? So um, I can maybe write that in there. Uh, this is cervix. And this is the top of the uterus, which is called the fundus. Okay, when you have endo, what actually happens is, whoops, you actually end up with this. Your uterus goes in at the cervix and then it curls around like this. So this is still your cervix. Oh, that is horribly. <laughs> Let's try that one a little more neat. Too thick a pen. This is still your cervix. And uh, I won't write at the very end there. That's okay. And this now over here is your fundus. Okay, so now we bring the ultrasound probe. We'll do that in green, I guess. So we're going to bring our ultrasound probe from here. And it's going to look like a little thing like this. And that's our ultrasound probe. And we're watching it on the great big TV screen to see what the picture looks like, right? So the problem with this is I need to go through all this distance from here to here in order to be able to see this part of the uterus. You can't see it properly. But when you put in a transvaginal ultrasound, the transvaginal ultrasound, I guess we'll do that one in blue, the transvaginal ultrasound, blue, will go right here. So a transvaginal ultrasound gets you right up against where you need to be. And you can see it crystal clear. The patient does not need a full bladder and there is no one reefing on your tummy, which I've seen before at other centers to try and see the uh, you know uterus and the lower uterine segment. Patients that are uncomfortable during their embryo transfer are gonna have a way lower success rate. We have zero discomfort when we're doing a transvaginal embryo, a transvaginal ultrasound embryo uh, transfer. Now, the big problem with this, I'm one of only, I think, two or three people that know how to do it in Canada. There are not a lot of us that I've heard of. I mean, I'm sure there are others, but I only know of a couple of us that know how to do it. It is difficult to do. And you need to use what's called the afterload technique, which means the uh, lab director or embryologist, whoever they are, must be in control of doing the embryo transfer part while you manage the ultrasound and the outer catheter. So it is for sure a two person procedure plus your nurse. That's probably it. We're done. Okay, cool. Uh, we can stop sharing, I guess. Uh, thank you very much for joining us on Fertility Factor Fiction. Uh, this was a great show. Lots of people, lots of good questions. Um, I do get to your questions on Instagram. So um, if your questions didn't get answered tonight, uh, I will post one of those ask me anything things maybe on the weekend. And I will make a whole bunch of videos again, like I did on uh, Wednesday night. Uh, or no, that was Sunday night, sorry. And I will answer all your questions. So sorry if we didn't get to it, but we will answer them. Um, just put them up there and uh, that'll be uh, um, you know, the stuff I can work on over the weekend. Have a wonderful week. Make sure you subscribe. Please subscribe. Um, and uh, we'll go from there. And uh, here's looking forward to a million views on YouTube. We're getting there, man. Very, very soon. I'm super pumped about that. Okay, guys, have a great night. We love you all. And thank you for all the kind words during the show. Much, much, much appreciated.